Hey guys, I'm sure most of you are caught up with this story since everyone on mainstream and alt media has been talking about it over the past week, but basically, as of this recording, Jussie Smollett has been charged with disorderly conduct for filing a false police report, and now we're just gonna have to wait and see how it goes. More than likely, they'll give him a fine and some community service, but I'm not expecting the Chicago prosecutors to go all out and make an example out of Jussie because the reality is that a tough maximum sentence for Jussie here will probably just keep the story alive much longer and I think the department just wants it to go away at this point because it's been really bad publicity for the city. That's just my prediction based on what I've been reading and hopefully I'm wrong about that but this video isn't really about the future as much. It's more about analyzing Jesse's motives and reasoning and planning this hoax and on that front I actually found a really good CNN clip if you can believe it, a Don Lemon clip and so Don brought on a Columbia professor named John McWhorter for an interview, uh, probably his last interview on CNN, which you'll see what I mean by that, but basically John made some excellent points about Jussie's thought process and the cultural environment we're currently living in that really encourages people to do these kinds of things for attention and for career advancement. And so I agreed a lot with John here, but he also violated pretty much all of CNN's usual talking points when it comes to racial politics. And so I'd be really surprised to see him back on CNN anytime soon. And to be honest, I actually had a pretty hard time digging around for this clip as well. It wasn't easy to find, but here are some highlights from that interview, and I think you'll see why CNN wasn't so keen about promoting it. Take a look. And you can imagine what he was thinking, and I know I'm getting a little bit creative, but you can imagine what he was thinking. He's been attacked. He becomes Jesse Christ, basically. And so he writes a book with somebody. Then he gets to do the audio of the book, and in between the chapters of the book, he would have songs that he wrote that he recorded. That audio book would become a big hit, and then he would get a talk show, and he would become Jesse Oprah. That's the sort of thing that he was waiting for because he knows that here in America, not only do we know that racism and homophobia exist, and we should, but he knows that we've gotten to the point that we are so bent on demonizing people like that Covington kid, demonizing somebody who voted for Donald Trump because they didn't prioritize racism as much as some of us do, that he actually thought that it would be a good idea to create something like this and become more famous than he was. And the sad thing is that if it had worked, he's right. He would have that talk show. He would be Jesse Christ. Where he's getting this is the idea that there's this larger narrative that we're supposed to keep in mind even in the place of facts. And so, Mike Brown, it's tragic that he died, but there is still an idea that Mike Brown died with his hands up. Now, the facts have made it quite plain that that's not what happened. There is you know, nothing beyond any shadow of a doubt that that's not how that boy died. But there's a certain sense that we're supposed to believe it on some larger level. I've heard ordinary people talking about it. I've certainly read esteemed intellectuals writing about it as if that somehow happened. Jesse Smollett has grown up in that kind of environment where he watches the facts being skirted in that way, where say a Rachel Dolezal, who's a white woman who walks around spray tan pretending that she's black, never says, okay, it was all just a big hoax and now I'm going to be white because that's who I am. But she kind of smirks to the cameras and kind of walks off into the sunset. Jesse Smollett has come of age within that. As tragic and pathetic as what Jelly, Jesse Smollett quote unquote allegedly did, as disgusting as it is, it's a sign that we've come further than we often like to admit. Because if things were really as bad as we're often told, and that's not to say that there is no racism and there's no homophobia, if it really was 1960 except the window dressing had changed, there could not be a Rachel Dolezal and there could never be a serious-minded, intelligent, brilliant performing person like Jesse Smollett who pulls something like this and comes out of it thinking that he's been wronged. We're doing better than we think. All right, well, hopefully you guys appreciated John's analysis there as much as I did. And I forgot to mention this earlier, but the reason CNN actually brought him on was to discuss this article that he published in The Atlantic the day before. So John touched on most of what he wrote in his interview with Don, but I also wanted to read just a few passages from his article because, again, I think he's really spot on in his commentary. So in one paragraph he writes, Racial politics today have become a kind of religion in which whites grapple with the original sin of privilege and 
and converts tar questioners of the orthodoxy as problematic blasphemers, and everyone looks forward to a judgment day when America comes to term with race. Smollett, if he really did stage the attack, would have been acting out the black American component in this eschatological configuration, which is the role of victim as a form of status. We are, within this hierarchy, persecuted prophets, ever attesting to the harm that white racism does to us and pointing to a future context in which our persecutors will be redeemed of the sin of having leveled that harm upon us. We are noble in our suffering. Right, so John's talking here about how minorities in our society, and specifically blacks in this case, how they're uh, educated to view themselves as victims of white patriarchy, and are also taught that if they call out their oppressors publicly, then they will enjoy a handsome societal reward. Because after all, victimhood is intrinsically virtuous, right? It is a positive good to be a victim in this leftist worldview. I mean, this is basically the modern identity politics playbook in a nutshell, which I'm pretty sure this audience already appreciates well enough. So moving on, John closes his piece with the following statement. Only in an America in which matters of race are not as utterly irredeemable as we are often told, could things get to the point that someone would pretend to be tortured in this way, acting oppression rather than suffering it, seeking to play a prophet out of a sense that playing a singer on television is not as glamorous as getting beaten up by white guys. That anyone could feel this way and act on it in the public sphere is, in a twisted way, a kind of privilege, and a sign that we have come further on race than we are often comfortable admitting. Yeah, so very good closing point there, right? He's arguing that blacks and really all of the various grievance identity groups enjoy their own special kind of privilege in society, which is the privilege of being able to advance in our society if you can successfully prove that you've been victimized by a white person. And ideally, multiple straight white men would be the uh, dream oppression scenario in 2019. I mean, there are real rewards to be won here if you can demonstrate this, which is exactly what Jesse was trying to do, right? There's no no denying that now, and hopefully with Jussie's failed attempt here, we'll see fewer and fewer of these hoaxes moving forward. But anyway, that's all I really wanted to share for this video. I do hope you guys enjoyed John's interview with Don, and as always, leave your thoughts down below, and I'll catch y'all in the next one.